It's a tremendous pleasure to introduce today Professor Alberto Kornblit to present the second international seminar in genetics, which is hosted by the Genetic Society of America, the Latin American Association of Genetics, the Brazilian Genetic Society, and the International Genetics Foundation Federation. Professor Kornblit is the world's preeminent authority on pre-mRNA splicing, the process by which a single gene generates multiple proteins. He and his students and postdocs study the relationship between splicing and transcription and the effects of DNA damage on this coupled process. They also study how changes in chromatin structure and histone post-translational modification modulate alternative splicing and the role of small non-coding RNAs in this process. That is, more globally, the relationship of RNA splicing to epigenetics. Let me tell you a little of the backstory of Professor Kornblit. Alberto grew up in Buenos Aires and obtained his PhD in biochemistry in 1980 with Hector Torres at Fondacion Campomar at the Universidad de Buenos Aires. He is therefore the academic grandson of Luis de Loire, the great Argentinian biochemist, 1970 novelist, and founder of Fondacion Campomar. After his PhD, Alberto spent four years from 1981 through 1984 as a postdoc at Oxford with Francisco Barale, where his interest and insights into alternative splicing were first kindled. With a 1985 publication in Imbo Journal, remarkable both for its insights and for its, its experimental elegance, given the technologies of the time. Alberto could have remained in Europe for his career, but in 1984 chose instead to go home to accept a faculty position at the Universidad de Buenos Aires and also at CONICIT, the Consejo Nacional de Investigaciones Científicas y Técnicas, that is the National Research Council of Argentina. In Buenos Aires, Alberto developed an exceptional group of young investigators. And together, over the last almost 40 years, they have elucidated the molecular mechanisms of alternative splicing. Their elegant work appears frequently in our outstanding journals, including IMBO Journal, PNAS, Science, Molecular Cell, I think his lab holds the world record for cover issues of Molecular Cell, and Cell, including a paper in Cell in June of this year that will form part of the presentation that we'll hear in a moment. Alberto is now Professor of Physiology and Molecular and Cell Biology at the Universidad de Buenos Aires and Senior Investigator at CONICET. He has just completed his 15-year tenure as a Howard Hughes investigator. He is a member of IMBO, of the Academia Nacional de Ciencias de Argentina, the Academia Internacional de Ciencias de Latina America, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and the Académie de Sciences de France. To me, the great question of Alberto's career is how he made the decision to return home from Europe in the early 1980s. In deciding to return to Argentina, he must have balanced the, the relative ease of doing good science in Europe versus the desire to do good work in and for his country, his assessment of the future economic and political stability of Argentina, which in 1984 was certainly in doubt, and his desire for his children to be Argentinian. In this calculation, I wonder if he was influenced by the example of Luis Leloire, who did it all 50 years earlier, without modern technology, without international communication, and essentially without reagents. I wonder if Alberto thought, if Le Loire can do this in 1945, I can do it in 1984. It is impossible to overstate the impact of Alberto on biomedical research in Argentina over the past decades. He is a major figure, perhaps the major figure, in the modern resurrection of Argentinian biomedical research by the combination of example in the lab and his contributions to national scientific development through CONICET. The best way I can capture the impact of Alberto Kornblit on science in Argentina is to tell you that he is to Argentinian science what Messi is to Argentinian football, whose colors <laughs> I am proud to wear today. With you, I very much look forward to Alberto's presentation, Chromatin Control of Alternative Splicing, towards a combined treatment 
of spinal muscular atrophy. Alberto. Mary Claire, thank you very much for your introduction. So kind, so lovely. Uh, I just answered to your question about why or how I returned to my country and, and, and did uh, my career there, of course, in close connection with, um, with the international community. And uh, there is an answer. It, it's my place in the world. So you try to improve, to fight, to work, uh, to make your place in the world a valuable place to live and to, to raise your children, your family, and to do try to do good science. So this is this is the answer, a place in the world. Mary Claire, I don't have words for you. You are very dear in our country because you help the abuela de Plaza de Mayo, the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo, to find the ways of uh, do the genetic analysis and in interpret the genetic analysis to identify the children that were kidnapped by the dictatorship, by the military, and to recover the actual biological link, the families, the original families of those children. So our country is uh, very grateful to you. Uh, you are very well known here. The human rights movement consider you a hero, and I consider you a hero too. So yeah, thank you. For this <laughs> yeah. So I will start with my seminar. I thank uh, Marcia and the organizers for this uh, honor they gave me about the chromatin control of alternative supplies and how this could help in a combined treatment for a hereditary, hereditary disease, spinal muscular atrophy. So alternative splicing is more a rule than an exception. It's estimated to affect the expression of nearly 95% of the human genes. It explains how a vast protein diversity can be achieved with a limited number of genes. We don't have many more genes than invertebrates, although we can make many more proteins uh, compared to them. Mutations that affect alternative splicing sequences, regulatory, regulatory sequences that are called splicing enhancers and silencers, are a widespread source of human disease. And the fourth item is that alternative splicing regulation not only depends on the interaction of uh, splicing factors, proteins with a pre mRNA, but it's coupled to RNA polymerase to transcription. And that's been the subject of my lab for the last 30 years. So when I was in Oxford working with Tito Barale, we cloned the human fibronectin gene. And at that time we found its alternative splicing that was the fourth or fifth case in, in, in uh, mammalian genes. And um, we found after different, different works, some of them done in my country, that actually the gene has three regions of alternative splicing and can produce up to 20 different messengers and 20 different polypeptides, five here, two here, and two here. And there is a correlation between the messenger variants and the polypeptide variants. So at that time, we thought that was the non plus ultra, meaning that there were no other genes that could produce more variant than this. And uh, the reality is that this is not the non plus ultra. And there is an only example I will show it is a DSCAM gene in Drosophila that can produce up to, in theory, 38,000 different messenger RNAs. In four regions of alternative splicing, they can produce here 12 alternatives, 48 here, 33 here, and two here. And I don't have time to show you neither the mechanism nor the uh, adaptive value, the function of this complex stochastic way of producing messengers, but actually has an adaptive value that allows the recursor of neurons to prevent establishing synapses is with themselves. So it's, it's what is called self-avoidance. But there is a philosophical problem here. Uh, the number of messenger variants this gene can produce is higher than the number of genes the fly has. So uh, th this, this uh, is important to the young generations to understand that some of the assertions in science are necessary transient, and the idea of one gene, one protein, one gene, one polypeptide uh, has to be replaced by this idea of one gene, many, many, many different proteins. So splicing is mostly co-transcriptional, and I will not show the whole evidence, but this is just uh, an EM of the Drosophila gene, and, and, and this is the, the um, 
cartoon I made of the original data. In black, you have the DNA. The, dot, the dots are, are the RNA polymerase II molecules that are advancing in the direction of the arrow. This is the promoter. And you can see that the nascent RNAs that are in, in purple already show uh, loops and spliceosomes that are excising the introns before Pol2 has reached the end of the gene. So in long genes and in many genes, most of splicing takes place before uh, transcription ends. But when we talk about uh, coupling, it's not only that there is a co-transcriptional reaction, but that there is an influence of either the Pol2 kinetics or the Pol2 recruitment of uh, um, proteins to the fate of splicing. And vice versa, sometimes there is, there is an, a coupling that involves uh, influence of splicing on the dynamics of Pol2 transcription. So what are the possible modes of coupling? There could be changes in Pol2 elongation rate, what we call kinetic coupling, and or, this is not mutually exclusive, recruitment of processing factors to the RNA polymerase to itself, to its carboxy terminal domain, to the chromatin or the nascent RNA that we call recruitment coupling. So we, in this uh, talk, will focus on the changes in Pol2 elongation in the kinetic coupling. And uh, we'll uh, deal with the role of transcription elongation in alternative splicing, the effects of chromatin structure, and finally, how this knowledge could be used in a recent work to um, foresee a combined therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. So uh, we studied for many years the kinetic coupling, and at the beginning, we found that slow elongation could produce higher alternative exon inclusion. And the model is the first comes first served. And if you see here an alternative exon with a weak 3 prime spliceite that is competing with a stronger one, and this is the DNA, when transcription takes place, the pre-mRNA presents to the splicing apparatus the two sides, and the stronger outcompetes the weaker one. So this would lead to skipping of the alternative exon. But on the contrary, if transcription is low, the positive factors are recruited to the weaker side before the stronger side is made. So there is recruitment to both uh, uh, splice sides, and then the exon will be included. But uh, as we saw in the case we were studying, the second exon is uh, spliced first, and the first exon is spliced second. So this is not a problem of order of intron removal, but the order of recruitment of splicing factors to a weaker side before its recruitment to a stronger side. So this mode of uh, kinetic coupling, uh, in which slow elongation produces higher exon inclusion, affects 50 to 80% of elongation-sensitive alternative splicing events. So not all of the alternative splicing events are elongation-sensitive, and those that are elongation sensitive, 50 to 80% follow this model. But there is a second opposite model in which slow elongation produces higher exon skipping. And this affects the complementary 20 to 50% of elongation sensitive uh, alternative displacing events. And uh, um, a postdoc from France, Gwendal Dujardin, in my lab some years ago, uh, uh, elucidated the mechanism by which a particular alternative splicing uh, followed this rule. And he, he found that there is an inhibitory protein in, in the case of the exon we were studying, this was ETR3. And if transcription was normal, ETR3 didn't have the chance to bind to the target site in the pre-mRNA and only the positive factors bound. So that would lead to exon inclusion. But if transcription was low, there was more, more time for the inhibitor to bind to the target site and to displace the positive factors, which would lead to exon skipping. So I, this is the second mode. It's, these are called class two exons, the ones in which slow elongation produces skipping. And I, I uh, ask you to remember this case because this is the case of the exon we are going to modulate in uh, spinal muscular atrophy in the second half of my talk. So the role of Pol2 elongation was confirmed in my lab by the use of a slow mutant of RNA polymerase II. 
So this mutant does not exist in, exist in humans, but it does exist in flies. And together with David Bentley, uh, we produce a human homologue of the uh, plasmid expressing the large subunit of uh, um, RNA polymerase II with a single amino acid change, this arginine for this histidine, and that makes that enzyme slower. So I don't have time to show we the raw data, but we'll show you just some of the examples. This is one of the class one exons in which slow elongations increases inclusion, upregulates inclusion, and you can see that the intensity of this band goes up and the intensity of the skip it band go, goes down. And this is the quantification, the ratio between inclusion and exclusion. And you see that with the slow polymerase, when the transcription is carried out by the slow polymerase, there is a fault for increase in exon inclusion. But this is the case Gwendal, the French postdoc was studying, in which slow elongation produces exon skipping. So uh, it's the same method, RT-PCR, but now transcription performed by the slow polymerase is analyzed in this second class of exons in which slow elongation produces skipping. So more recently, Javier Cáceres, an Argentinian who works in Edinburgh, who is professor in Edinburgh, generated um, uh, mutant mice with the slow polymerase. And uh, when we say slow, we are talking about three to four fold slower compared to the normal one. And that change in speed was enough to make the, 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 the system uh, embryonic lethal. So the, 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 the mice uh, were aborted very early and, and, and that they didn't progress. But he managed to grow the cells from the aborted um, pups. And uh, those cells that had the slow polymerase had many changes in transcription and many changes in splicing. But most importantly, the differentiation that usually occurs when they are, they are subjected to certain cocktails of, of uh, growth factors did not occur. So he could grow the cells, but they did not differentiate. So it, it, this tells us how important is a critical speed of uh, transcription for not only for the life of the whole animal, but also for the um, fate of the cells. So what can modulate pol 2 elongation in, uh, in real life, not with a mutant enzyme that doesn't exist in mammalian cells? Well, it could essentially be two non-exclusive uh, me mechanisms. Uh, up is the modulation of pol 2 intrinsic activity via CTD phosphorylation, the carboxy terminal domain, or the association to elongation factors. And the second mode is uh, changes in the chromatic uh, structure of the template that could either limit or facilitate elongation. So you can see here that if the track is the RNA polymerase 2 uh, with a, with a uh, smooth pavement, it can go faster, but also it will depend on how few we, we apply. But in the case of um, uh, dust road, for instance, with our pebbles, of course, the track cannot go so far, so fast, and there are changes in elongation. So, of course, we will focus on the second mode because this is again the one we are going to modulate in. Um, in the case of the spinal muscular atrophy. So uh, many uh, graduate students in my lab, uh, and this is something I will introduce now that in South America, we have excellent graduate students. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot attract many postdocs because of course the postdocs want to do the postdoc in the United States or in Europe or, or maybe in other countries that are richer. But uh, most of our excellent science is performed by excellent graduate students because our public universities are really very, very good. So uh, this is uh, the work of many graduate students in my lab, mainly uh, Ignacio Shore. And we show that alternative splicing regulation uh, was affected by uh, chromatin structure. So essentially, if we have a compact chromatin, close chromatin, then pol 2 goes slow. And in one of the cases we were studying, uh, it produced, for instance, skipping. But then this situation could be reverted if we open the chromatin with a histone deacetylase inhibitor like that, valproic acid, VPA. So with a relaxed chromatin, POL2 could go faster and then could revert the uh, uh, fate of alternative splicing because this event was regulated as a class two exon. 
So the other important message is that we are not looking at changes in chromatic focus on the promoter or enhancers. We always uh, look at what happens around the alternative exon, intragenically, far from the promoter, some, sometimes thousands of these pairs downstream of the promoter, because we want to know how that a local uh, compa compaction or opening would affect the alternative splicing event according to changes in elongation. So what are the uh, clues for these changes in structure? Are histomodifications. And we will study in, in, in several of our work, uh, uh, K9 methylation, lysine 9 methylation of histone 3 that this is a silencing mark, it produces compaction, produces um, uh, a roadblock, a transient roadblock to polymerase. And uh, the opposite mark is the acetylation of lysine 9 of histone 3, that is a permissive mark. This opens the chromatin and allows uh, polymerase to go through. But of course, there is also the K27 uh, methylation, that is a silencing mark, and it's very well known because it forms part of the polycom mechanism. So uh, the concept of alternative uh, chromatin alternative splicing is that a, a given gene in the same cell in two different situations could change the chromatin configuration and that would affect splicing. Even if it doesn't affect the total amount of messenger the gene is producing, it could affect the quality of the messenger. So for instance, in the case of the NCAM gene, uh, neuron depolarization could uh, generate uh, K9 acetylation opening the chromatin and in this particular exon produce skipping. But on the contrary, neuron differentiation promotes the opposite mark, the K9 methylation. It closes the, 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 the chromatin, it's low elongation, and then it goes to inclusion. So this is again important for the case of the spinal muscular atrophy we're going to comment uh, in a few minutes. So let's go now to the disease. Why I, I started studying the disease, I, I think I have time, I will tell you the story. Actually, my lab for 20, 25 years was working on the basic mechanisms and we didn't work in any uh, uh, disease or related to disease. But then about seven years ago, the families of the children with SMA uh, came to my lab in Buenos Aires, knocked at my office at the door, and say, Alberto, we want you to work in the splicing of spinal muscular atrophy. We know that Adrian Craner, a close friend of mine who is the leader of the um, therapy, is about to uh, get the uh, approval of FDA for, for an uh, oligonucleotide that will cure the disease. But anyway, we wanted to work in this because you are an expert in splicing and we want some to do this research in Argentina. And I said, listen, I have nothing to offer. I never worked in a disease. I don't, win, I, I don't want to promise you things that I cannot um, do. Uh, and I said at the beginning, no. Then I uh, decided to test together with my graduate student, uh, Luciano Marasco, whether uh, the kinetic coupling, the way we were working on basic science uh, was ap ap applicable to this disease. And the answer is yes. And then I phone them, I say, I have something to tell you, okay? We could study this. And they, uh, of course, supported us. And we started a very uh, beautiful relationship in which that changed my life because I started to go to the meetings where the families go, with the patients, with the children, uh, to read their letters, to participate in all the activities. And you will see um, uh, the end of the story. And I, I should tell you that they know that the parents, the families know more about molecular biology and splicing than many of us because they read and they, not, they are uh, up to date with all the um, complications and the basics of it. And also they have a very clear um, uh, science administration ideas. They said, we don't want you to cure the disease. We want you to work on the disease, okay? Sometimes uh, the officials of our, our countries don't understand that I want us to have a, a solution right now. So this disease is, is, is a autosomal recessive and it's caused by, because there is a, a defect in the development of motor neurons, which in turn causes poor innervation and atrophy. And so 
Uh, it's caused by the mutations in the SMN1 gene. And uh, this gene, when it's mutated, um, doesn't produce the SMN protein. And the SMN protein is uh, expressed in all tissues, all organs, and is necessary for the formation, for the uh, um, uh, assembly of uh, SNRPs, which are components of the splicing machinery. And splicing takes place in all cells. So the first question is how, how the children uh, get to term, how they survive pregnancy. Well, they survive pregnancy because in the same chromosome, there is the second gene, a paralog called SMN2, that is the same length. It's about 30,000 30, base pairs, but it has 11 uh, base uh, pair differences, 11 nucleotide difference compared to SMN1. So it's able to make the right protein, but because one of those changes uh, creates a splice in silence or exon 7, it uh, prevents efficient inclusion of exon 7. So it goes to skipping of exon 7, and that produces a truncated protein that is uh, degraded. So it produces 80% of the useless protein and 20%, about 20% of the healthy protein, which compensates for the lack of the protein in the mutation of uh, SMN1. And then this allows, we see the disease because of this, because the children are, bir are, are birthed. Um, and then uh, if they are not treated or uh, ventilated with uh, mechanical ventilation, they would die in, in, in a few months because their muscles cannot move. So the second question is why um, the lack of this protein and the production of very little amount of the other protein affects uh, motor neurons and affects muscle? Well, we don't know exactly, but this is not surprising because in many diseases affecting gene expression, there is one tissue, one organ that is more sensitive to the lack or to the reduction of the protein and the others uh, can cope with it, okay? So uh, we know that it's important for other organs, but the critical ones are motor neurons and the critical ones are the innervation of muscle. So Adrian Craner, who is from Uruguay, a country that is in between Brazil and Argentina, but he developed all his career in, in, um, in the States, he works in Cold Spring Harbor, developed a tool a medicine uh, that is called nusinersen and the fantasy name nusinersen and the commercial name Sinraza, that is an antisense modified oligonucleotide. So what nusinersen does is to bind to the pre-mRNA of SMN2 or the SMN2 gene and displace a negative factor that is called HNNPA1 and A2, and then modify this splicing of the SMN2 gene towards more production of the full length containing exon 7 and making the right protein. So this turned to be successful in clinical trials, and I will show you one of the cases. But essentially, I want also to tell you that this is not strictly speaking gene therapy, because gene therapy would be to correct the a faulty gene or to introduce a healthy gene in the same genome. Here, we don't introduce any new genes. We just correct the splicing of an existing gene to produce more of the healthy protein. So Cameron was diagnosed with SMA type one at five uh, weeks old. Doctors said he only had six to 12 months to live. He could live longer, prostrated with mechanical ventilation, and his parents enrolled him in an experimental drug trial called Nusinersen Spinraza by Ionis Pharmaceuticals, developed by Adrian Craner at Cold Spring Harbor. And the video shows what happened. Seven we weeks old before starting the treatment. Okay, has belly breathing, a little movement, uh, and the, have no reflex or so very little reflexes, and uh, the bell shaped uh, legs. Four and a half months old, grabbing objects. Good. And this says one year old holding a heavier toy. 20 months old, standing, exclamation point. Three years old, riding a tricycle. But you can understand that this boy without any spin rasa uh, would have died at uh, six, six months old and, and, and never walk and never 
ride the tricycle. So this is impressive and was one of the first, if not the first, um, neurological neurodegenerative disease that was cured. That's why Adrian is is really uh, um, a hero to the families and to the medical community. So the question or the experiment we performed, and that's why I phoned the families to say, I have something we could proceed, is the question whether it was, if exon seven of SMN2 was controlled by pol 2 elongation. And the answer is yes. When we transcribed the gene with a slow polymerase in cells in culture, there was a reduction of exon seven inclusion. So it belonged to the class two exons. But um, then we went to the published data by uh, David Bentley, who had uh, created cell lines with a wild type, with a fast one with slow polymerase, and look at the exon 7 of SMN2. And you can see whether the fast polymerase, it goes up. And with the slow polymerase, inclusion goes down. So it was confirmed in an independent way. So uh, we don't want a slow polymerase because inclusion goes down. So we reasoned that chromatin opening should increase the cement to exon inclusion by promoting intragenic pol 2 elongation. So we decided to use histone deacetylase inhibitors in principle trichostatin A or TSA or valproic acid or VPA to promote histone acetylation and to open the chromatin and see what happens with the oligo with the antisense oligonucleotide. So at the beginning, I have to say that all the experiments we call the oligonucleotide ASO1 that is exactly as nucinersum, but it has two more bases just for propriety reasons. We didn't want to uh, have to uh, uh, explain that we were using something, but Craner had uh, showed that this oligo show, has exactly the same power and the same um, um, function of the uh, original nucinersum. So in cells in culture, you can see, and these are the intensities of the band, that when you treat the cells with ASO1, there is an increase in exon inclusion. Trichostatin also increases, but the two together increase even more. And then uh, this is also observed with valproic acid, but it's a different chemistry. Okay, ASO1 increases inclusion, VPA increases inclusion, and both of them increase more. So uh, Luciano, the first author of the paper, you will see the picture later, uh, he had done a lots of controls in cells in culture during one year with all the possible, you know, drugs and, 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 and uh, mechanisms. But at a certain point, I said, after one year of his thesis, we have to go and inject mice. We had to see what happens with the mouse model for the disease with the two uh, drugs together. So he went to Adrian's lab in uh, Cold Spring Harbor. They have a beautiful animal house with all the system set. And uh, they decided to use uh, as an SMA mouse model that is, that is the Taiwan strain. And let me explain why we have to use this strain. Because in, in mice, there is only one SMN gene. So if you introduce mutations in the two alleles of this gene, and this is a genetics society, this is embryonic lethal. So as it is, a mutated mouse is not good enough because you never see the, the pups. But so the Taiwanese researchers decided to do a transgene, a transgenic with the human SMN2 genes that you know that produces 20% of the right protein. So in this system, the deleted or mutated SMN mouse gene and the human transgene, uh, the mice uh, uh, get birth and they are born and uh, they live for about seven days. After seven days, they die. But anything you do there to increase inclusion of the human exon seven will make them survive or gain weight or behave well. So this is a good model because essentially it's good to test any treatment that will increase the lifespan or the weight of the mice that otherwise would die after seven days. So we decided to use a protocol that had been used before, is the single subcutaneous injection of uh, ASO1 and or an HDAC inhibitor uh, at day one or two after birth. And then we didn't do anything else. We could have done, we could have continued to inject, but it wasn't proof of principle. And we wanted to see what happened with the, with the lifespan of these mice with a single injection, a single subcutaneous injection. 
at the staging with the uh, brain blood barrier has not been uh, formed yet. So uh, when you inject subcutaneously, it goes everywhere to the brain, to the motor neurons, to the liver, to, every, to everywhere. So you can say here, 11 days old mice, they survive. Uh, this is the normal one, the heterozygous, and these are the ones that were injected with uh, ASO1 alone. They are smaller than the heterozygous, but these are the ones that were injected with both uh, the uh, ASO1 and the histone deacetylase inhibitor. You see they are bigger and they have the same size as the normal one, the heterozygous. Uh, this is 40 days old, so they survive a lot. Uh, with ASO1, they uh, are smaller, but with ASO1 and tricostatin A, they are bigger. And then this is the body weight uh, curve in which you see that the ones injected with the valproic acid alone, the histone deacetylase inhibitor, die at seven days. So VPA doesn't do anything at all. But the ones that are injected with ASO1 alone in suboptimal dose gain weight but the ones that were injected with both drugs gain, gain even more compared to heterozygous. So what I'm not telling you is how many mice survive at 60 days, and you can see it here. And these are the survival curves that show a more spectacular result. The ones injected with valproic acid alone die at seven days because that's nothing. The ones injected with suboptimal doses of ASO1 also die earlier, and the ones with the two drugs survive much more. So this is important because something that does, doesn't do anything by itself helps a lot when applied together with the Craner's uh, medicine, with the uh, oligonucleotide. So, um, this is the same with tricostatin A, similar curves, the survival curve and the weight gain. And also uh, Luciano did Western blots to see what happened in the organs uh, of mice untreated, treated with uh, TSA, with a histone deacetylase inhibitor alone, with ASO1 and with ASO1 by TSA and uh, TSA. And you can see that in all cases, the amount of SMN, human SMN protein in the mice is much higher when the two drugs are uh, applied together. And also that TSA alone doesn't do anything. In the cells, I show you that the histone deacetylase inhibitors upregulated exon inclusion, but that was in cells. In the mice, uh, the histone deacetylase inhibitor doesn't increase inclusion per se, but it helps ASO1 to increase um, the normal levels or higher levels of the SMM protein. So, uh, and it was uh, a surprise because when Luciano was in, in Cold Spring Harbor, he sent me by WhatsApp two movies and I said, what did you do? And he was doing uh, neuromuscular function tests that were very surprising. This is the surface writing test. You place the pub upside down and you measure the time it takes to write itself. And you can see that the ones injected with the nucimersin alone take some time, but the one injected at the same age with the two drugs uh, writes itself immediately. So you can quantify this, and this is the heterozygous, the, the normal one that writes itself immediately. Uh, the mutant, untreated mutant, takes about 50 seconds to write itself. Uh, VPA or the VPA does nothing. Uh, ASO1 improves and ASO1 plus VPA improved a lot the neuromuscular function. And also you can measure the grip strength, grip strength. And this for pups, you have to use a rough tablet and uh, uh, allow them to climb and measure the angle on which the mice uh, fall. And you can see that uh, the ones injected with ASO1 alone fall at a lower angle than the ones injected with ASO1 and VPA. And you can quantify this again. Uh, this is done many, many times and you can see that uh, the normal ones uh, almost fall at 90 degrees, but um, the disease one fall much uh, much lower angles. But when we treat with both ASO1 and BPA, uh, the strength of the of the four limbs improves. So um, just to the end of my talk, let me tell you that we found uh, that the um, ASO1, the, the oligo, also had chromatin effects. So we analyzed what happened with chromatin when we uh, transfected cells with uh, these uh, antisense oligo. 
And the fact is we were inspired in a paper we had published uh, some years ago, Mariano Alio in my lab, uh, try to see what happened when we transfect cells with intronic siRNAs. siRNAs are double-stranded, are short RNAs. And uh, if you uh, direct the guide strand to an uh, intronic, intronic uh, sequence, it will not cause post-transcriptional post gene silencing because uh, messengers in the cytoplans uh, do not have introns. So all the effects we were looking at were uh, nuclear effects. And what he found is that base pairing of the guide strand of uh, an, uh, siRNA with a pre-mRNA would recruit uh, K9 methylation enzymes and, and generate a roadblock to pol 2 elongation that uh, needed AGO1 and needed HV1 alpha, which is a heterochromatin protein. So this was local. And if this roadblock was downstream of an alternative exon, then it would increase exon inclusion, higher alternative exon inclusion. So we wonder whether ASO1, which is not an siRNA, it's, it's, it's a single-stranded uh, oligonucleotide, which is difficult to tell whether there is an RNA or, or a DNA because it's heavily modified. So all the, 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 the two prime uh, hydroxyl is replaced by, by an, uh, an alkyl group and, and then uh, the phosphate has a sulfur. So it's heavily modified, chemically modified. So I, I, we don't know exactly whether it's an RNA or a, a DNA, it's a piece of, uh, of uh, nucleic acid of the same length, 20 nucleotides. So does ASO1 create a roadblock to elongation? And the answer is yes. We have a chip here, a chip a qPCR uh, for K9 methylation along the SMN2 gene. And you can see that in the control is the gray line. There is almost no methylation, but when we transfect with ASO1, there is an increase of methylation. And that increase is abolished, sorry, by treatment with VPA is the purple line, and VPA alone does nothing. But then when we did a chip with um, antibodies against RNA polymerase 2 along the SMN2 gene, and this is the site, the target site of the ASO1 of the nusinersen, you can see again that there is a roadblock to an accumulation of pol 2 elongation. Uh, and that accumulation is abolished by treatment with uh, the histone deacetylase inhibitor. The histone deacetylase inhibitor does do, doesn't do anything uh, per se, and the control also is flat. So we propose a model in which ASO1 does two different things. On the one hand, is it displaces the negative factors from the pre-RNA that was discovered by Craner. But on the other hand, by promoting K9 methylation, it has the opposite effect because it creates roadblock to elongations, elongation, and that would uh, prevent exon 7 inclusion. So when we treat the cells or the mice with a histone deacetylase inhibitor and we open the chromatin, then we uh, counteract this negative effect and then both contribute to exon inclusion and the production of more uh, healthy protein. And that's why we see the mice. Um, much more happy or much happier. Okay, so a, a, a quick, a, a, um, a key question is how pleiotropic is PPA? Because actually when we treat with the ASO, we are only affecting the target gene, the target is SMN2, but VPA is a general drug. Well, first of all, we decided to use VPA valproic acid because it was approved, it is approved by FDA and other agencies for the treatment of um, uh, epileptoid syndromes. So uh, if it is used in humans, it, we thought it's easier for us to uh, do clinical trials with something that is approved. But then, uh, of course, the reviewers wanted to see genome-wide uh, um, analysis. And you can see here that if you do a metagene analysis of RNA pol 2 densities, in the control cells and the ones treated with UPA, the whole genome increases elongation because you measure, this is the promoter signal, this is the gene body signal. So the proportion of the uh, signal in the promoter decreases in favor of the gene body. This is when we treat with PPA, but the metagene analysis for ESO1 does nothing, of course, because we are just uh, affecting one of the 23,000 genes, not all of them. 
But then we did RNA-seq in the HEC-293 T cells uh, transfected uh, uh, with ASO and, with VP and treated with VPA. And actually, this volcano plot indicates that although there are many changes in expression caused by VPA, only a few of them, a few of them are uh, statistically significant. Uh, so about 69 to 70, 70 genes increase um, expression or decrease expression uh, with a um, uh, log 10 p that is uh, usually used as as a cutoff. Uh, on the other hand, the ASO does nothing in gene expression globally, and ASO plus VPA, of course, uh, does similar to the VPA alone, because if ASO does nothing, uh, here we have about 100 genes which either increase or decrease expression compared to the untreated uh, cells. And uh, surprisingly, also in alternative splicing analysis, genome-Y, there are changes, but only a few of them increase or increase exon inclusion. So uh, in our hands, we were expecting many more changes, but actually in the conditions we were treating the cells, uh, we didn't see uh, uh, huge changes, uh, huge pleiotropic effects. Of course, it's a, it suffices only one gene overexpressed can, can of course ruin the, 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 the prospects of using this, but in glo at least globally, there aren't uh, uh, too, many, too many changes. So I'm gonna finish by uh, concluding that we found the mechanism for the kinetic coupling in general, in which slow elongation can promote either exon inclusion or skipping, depending on the particular alternative splicing events. As I mentioned, there are type one exons in which slow elongation produces higher inclusion and type two exons, and they are not the same. They have to be in different regions of the same gene or in different genes. We also introduce the concept of alternative chromatin, alternative splicing. That means that changes in the chromatin configuration of a single gene uh, could affect the quality of uh, the mRNA that is produced and not necessarily the quantity because it would affect splicing decisions. And also we are proposing a combined therapy for spinal muscular atrophy in which ASO1, Spinraza, could be combined with uh, chromatin opening drugs like valproic acid or uh, other drugs. And on the basic mechanism, we show that Spinraza, ASO1, has two opposite effects. The negative effect is counteracted by opening the chromatin with histone deacetylase inhibitor. So it's not only opening the chromatin, but counteracting a putative negative effect of the ASO. So uh, we were lucky enough to have the cover of cells and um, this was designed by Luciana Jono. Luciana is a former member of my group who, who quit science and decided to work on uh, science illustration and she does very well, I would say. So we were discussing with Luciana, um, uh, we wanted to, to, to um, illustrate the balance between uh, histone marks and exon inclusion. So at the beginning, we, we discussed on a, on, a, on a scale with two plates, but then it came to our mind we could use a, a model like a, a Calder, Alexander Calder um, mobile. And you can see here in the mobile that if there is K, uh, histone A3, K9 acetylation, uh, exon 7, that is the white platelet, is included. While if there is K9 methylation, the opposite effect, the white plate is not included. So this is an allegory for the effects of chromatin on exon inclusion. So this is the hero of our story, Luciano Marasco, who is now doing a postdoc in Oxford. Um, during the pandemic, uh, while well, we have our, most of the work done, but we couldn't continue because the lab was closed. Because of the seasons, uh, when we were closed, Europe, Europe was starting to open. So we asked our former, my former, the postdoc Gwendal de Jardin, who was in Nick Proudfoot's lab in Oxford, if he wanted to help us while we couldn't get into the lab. So he did part of the experiments in, 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 uh, you know, in, in a different time compared to our accessibility to the lab. And then Luciano went there to help him. So of course, Adrian is, is a huge uh, support for this project, Nick, I mentioned. Uh, 
Jose Stiliano Pepe, uh, he's a, a graduate student who is continuing with the work of Luciano in the lab. Uh, and he, he's, uh, he comes from Italy, actually, but he, he has an Argentinian family. And uh, Rui Sosa Luis from, from Portugal, from Lisbon, who was the one who helped us with the um, bioinformatics of the genome-wide studies. And of course, I have to thank, I had the support from HHMA, but before I started this project, it was an international scholarship, it was an HHMA investigator. Uh, there is an order of magnitude in support difference between HHMA investigator and HHMA international scholar. But anyway, it was very, very instrumental for uh, fostering my science. And, and I, I want to mention the families. Uh, uh, after FAME Argentina supported our research, we applied for grants from the US Association that has uh, international reputation and, in, and, and peer review. And actually, I, I have to thank them also because they supported me for two consecutive grants and I just got the third one. And also, uh, Argentina, uh, um, through the National Agency for Science and Technology, the university, of course, the CONICET, and also the Lounsbury Foundation uh, um, that also is supporting me for a third time now. So we we keep we keep working, and uh, we are, as I mentioned, I mean, I still believe that basic science is essential, but once you get in touch with the problems of the families and the patients, your life also changes. Uh, but without basic science, neither Adrian, who have devised uh, the, developed spin rasa because he was studying the basic mechanisms of control of alternative splicing, and we uh, we, we we couldn't we we, we would never uh, touch this uh, this um, possibility of a combined therapy without our knowledge of the control of elongation in basic research. So I leave you, leave to you in Spanish. Gracias. Thank you very much, Alberto. What a what a tour de force! Absolutely spectacular. Um, it, it, would people who have questions please put them in the chat at least at first? Uh, several questions were put into the chat before we began, presumably on the basis of the cell paper. I believe that Alberto has in fact responded to all of those questions in the course of the talk. But if the people presenting those questions have additional questions, please add them, and I'll I'll pick them up out of the chat again. Um, as people are are adding to the chat, let, let me begin with a question going back to the the basic mechanisms of uh, of alternative splicing. You spoke about early work in flies and the extraordinary um, level of stochasticity for some genes in flies. Could you comment more globally? on which mechanisms of alternative splicing are conserved between uh, Drosophila and mammals and which are not? Well, I think they are mainly conserved because uh, RNA polymerase two um, genes, uh, the introns are excised by the spliceosome. The spliceosome is a uh, mega particle that is made of SNRPs, which in turn are uh, are small uh, nuclear RNAs and different proteins and other auxiliary proteins. And, and the signals for the recognition of the beginning and the end of an intron are exactly the same. So essentially, um, there are no big differences in the basic mechanism of splicing. There are no big differences with plants either. So in plants, we have introns that have the same uh, consensus sequences for the um, donor and acceptor. And actually, we are studying uh, alternative splicing in plants. We found that light controls alternative splicing in plants through the chloroplast. Right. And during the daylight, uh, polymerase 2 goes faster than during the night. So that affects splicing decisions. It's exactly the same. The, the difference is that the genes uh, in plants are not conserved compared to, to mammals. And also in plants, uh, introns are shorter and, and, um, and there is a particular way of alternative splicing that's, that is intron retention that is more common in plants compared to, to animals. But flies and, and mammalian cells are very similar. Yeah, 
Very similar. Thank you very much. Let me begin now with some of the many questions that are coming coming through, and there are also vast numbers of Mazel Tovs, so just be ready for it <laughs> when you get this list. But for, for substantive questions, I'm going to, either, the first question is actually a, a clinical one. I'm going to come back to that in a moment, but um, let me first come to a more, a more basic question. From uh, Tino Negrito, she asks, is there a way to provide VPA in a targeted way to avoid some of the side effects? Well, uh, this is the, this is what we are working now, and and we are not sure we are going to succeed. Yes, there is a way, at least in cells in culture, that is uh, using the uh, CRISPR, but you, instead of using a, a normal Cas9 that has a uh, nuclease activity, uh, you use a dead Cas9, a Cas9 that uh, has a mutation that uh, um, impairs and doesn't allow to, to cut the DNA. And uh, you fuse to that dead Cas9 a histone modifying enzyme. So using the right guide RNAs, you direct the dead Cas9 with the histone deacetylase or histone acetylase enzyme to your target gene and see whether it changes the chromatin locally. And that if that change affects splicing. So this is what we are planning to do we don't have results so far. It has been done in the past in other systems. And of course, if, if it works, it could be, eventually it could be used in, in, in clinic, in clinical, but, but I'm not sure. It's, that's lovely. This is a, a closely related question from Maria Spletter. Um, I'm going to read off the question, although you have already addressed the first part of it. Is it known what the long-term effects of treatment with HDAC inhibitors are? How realistic is a combined treatment with spinrasa and HDAC inhibitor long term? Is it known if U2, for example, SF3B1 variants also influence splice dependent disorders like SMA? Oh, well, the second question, I, I'm not really uh, aware of this. Um, of course, SFP3 is, import, SFP3 is, is important in many diseases. Uh, no, I don't know what the long-term effects would be. Uh, we have to proceed to clinical trials. It's not an easy task because the number of, of children is very small. Right. And um, also, we don't have any idea. Of course, spinrasa is applied uh, by uh, intrathecal, uh, so in the spinal fluid injection. And uh, I don't think valproic acid will be applied there. It will be probably systemic. But um, as I told you, there are there is experience on the use of valproate in other diseases. So I guess uh, we have to use the the doses that are shown that were shown not to be uh, too disruptive to see whether they have any positive effect. Let me. This is related with our idea. We we discussed this in the paper. Is that uh, when when spinrasa is injected intrathecally. Uh, of course, it reaches the nervous system, but there is clearance of that through the uh, brain blood barrier, and uh, there is some spin rasa reaching the periphery. As I mentioned, spin, uh, uh, SMN protein is important in the periphery, so our bet is that perhaps the lower concentrations of spin rasa that reach the periphery, the liver, the pancreas, the, I don't know, the um, muscle, uh, would be lower, low enough to be helped by BPA. So I, I don't figure out that BPA would help in the motor neurons because the doses of pinbrasa that are applied intrathetically are very, very high per se. But I, I would fancy that BPA could be helpful in the periphery to improve the general state of the, of the kids. So, um, but I, I essentially, we don't have any results on clinical trials so far. So then um, to, to come back to the question of Carlos Menck, um, where does this stand clinically now? It, uh, are, are any of these compounds already used in clinics? Can you How is dosage settled upon if so? No, well, uh, of course, Pinrasa is used in clinics. There are probably sure. more than 10,000 um, um, 10, people treated with, with Pinrasa in the world. It's very expensive, but there are agreements between the companies and the governments that this is covered by uh, social health or uh, by the state in case there are 
families that are not covered by private uh, medicine. But um, uh, the combination hasn't been proved, Carlos. Uh, VPA, yes, it, it has been uh, tested in, in, uh, in other diseases, uh, neurological diseases like uh, epilepsy, but not has no effect per se in um, SMA because there was a clinical trial many years ago called Carnival in which uh, the kids were treated just with valproic acid on the assumption that it would increase transcription of the gene, but the results were negative, had no effect in the cure of the disease. So the, which is consistent with the fact that that was the time before Spinraza, a long VPA oh, right. in humans has no effect. Right. And this is consistent with other results, our results in mice. Exactly. VPA alone have no, 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 no effect. Lovely. Let me come back to a, a, a question that, that spans clinical and basic uh, issues. This is from Veska Sharma. Could you comment regarding the resolution of effect on ASO uh, on histone modification as the effect, is the effect localized or is it sequenced? Is it fact localized, sequence specific, or otherwise? Well, uh, we did some genome-wide experiments uh, with a transfection of cells with uh, spin Raza, and we saw effects smaller compared to the ones we saw with the QP, with the chip qPCR on the gene, um, which were specific. Okay, but of course, I cannot. Uh, be certain in terms of that there might be some other methylation somewhere. So in the genome-wide um, chip seq, uh, there was a little effect on the gene, and we didn't see any effects uh, somewhere else. But it could be. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure. Right. Let's take one last question. This one is from Laura Lafon Hughes. She says, "Have you tried, it, it, perhaps only in cell culture, other chromatin structure modifiers rather than VPA?" No, we tried the families of histone deacetylase inhibitors. I mentioned TSA and VPA. We also tried SAHA, which is the same chemistry as um, TSA. Well, we tried, but in cells in culture, um, inhibition of methylation by um, 5A C. 5A C um, inhibits DNA methylation, but also histone methylation, and, and it has the expected results, although that cannot be applied in, in patients. So from the mechanistic point of view, we try also camptothecin. Camptothecin inhibits elongation, and uh, camptothecin works like uh, the slow polymerase, for instance. So there are several indirect effects that those are the experiments I mentioned that Luciano was doing in the first year before we went to inject mice. Right. There are many more comments and questions, and I hope that that the GSA Secretariat will will be able to send to you all of the extremely positive comments on this extraordinary talk. Alberto, it has been an afternoon to remember forever. Lovely science <laughs> with a with a truly a truly excellent result for the families. Thank you so much. Thank you all for attending. So we look forward to seeing you all at the next International Science Seminar. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all, and thank you, Mary Claire. Sure. Hasta la próxima. Bye.